In this video, we're going to be theorizing about some questions that the end of the game leaves open to us. Because these questions arrive at the end of the game, as a consequence, there will be end of game spoilers. So if you want to avoid any spoilers whatsoever, please turn back now. At the very end of the game, after you destroy the Institute, and if you side with either the Railroad or the Minutemen, you can go back to Desdemona, and she says something unexpected. Lara, with the Institute dealt with, we're reevaluating our ongoing operations, and the LNL gang is currently our single greatest threat. Glory had been pushing me to deal with them for years. Looks like she finally gets her wish. Who is this LNL gang? They're not so much a gang, really as a loosely affiliated group of raiders. What sets them apart from the usual filth is they take a particular sadistic pleasure in finding and executing synths. We've lost more synths to them over the years than even the coursers. I miss Glory too, Des. I only wish she was here for this. If they're that big a problem, we should have done this when Glory was alive. If we had started picking off LNL, that pattern would have been recognized by the SRB immediately. But now, we can bring them down without that risk. Just tell me where to go. We got a lead on one of Ellen L's big dogs, Lucky Tatum. Deal with him. The L and L gang? Why is this the first time we've heard of them? W wait a minute, Desdemona says that the railroad has lost more synths to the L and L gang than to the Institute? The institute that has a vested interest in reclaiming their synths. The institute that has an entire bureau called the Synth Retention Bureau dedicated to nothing but finding and capturing synths. This loosely organized band of raiders that are bound by nothing more than a sadistic pleasure of killing synths has killed more than the institute has reclaimed? That seems surprising to me, and more so that we only hear about them after defeating the Institute. Why did they not come up earlier? After accepting Desdemona's mission, we gain the quest to the mattress. To the mattress is an Italian phrase that basically means prepare for battle. There are two possible explanations for the origin of this phrase. The first comes from the year 1530. At that time, King Charles V and Medici Pope Clement VII combined their forces and laid siege to the city of Florence. A man named Michelangelo Buonarroti was put in charge of the city's defenses, and one of the things he did to mitigate damage done by cannon fire was to hang mattresses from the bell tower. The mattresses from the bell tower were visible all over the city, and so when someone would ask a friend, where do I go to see the action, or where can I go to help, the friend would respond, to the mattresses, because that's where the action was. The second explanation also comes from Italy, but it comes from the Italian mob. When mob families were at war with each other, the families would leave their homes and hide in apartments and other inconspicuous places. They would then take turns guarding in shifts. Some of the mafia family members would stand guard while others slept on mattresses. Since so many of these Mafia family soldiers were housed in very tight, cramped, small apartments, there would be mattresses all over the place, littering the floor. The mattresses became such a prominent memory of these times of warfare between mob families that it became a euphemism. If we were to prepare for battle, we were to go to the mattresses. That phrase became well known in America after it was used in The Godfather and again in The Sopranos. I'm not sure which explanation is accurate. I can't find a consensus online, but those are the two possible explanations I have. But it's clear why the phrase is used here. The railroad is finally going to war with the LNL gang. But what does L and L stand for? We just have no answers here. We've never heard of them before. They're not important in the rest of the story, and Desdemona doesn't really tell us anything. I'm assuming L and L might possibly stand for the initials of some of the founding members of the gang, but the only member whom we are sent to kill, whose name starts with an L, is Lucky Tatum. This is the first person we are sent to kill. In total, there are seven raider bosses who are members of the LNL gang, and we are sent as assassins. The game randomly selects one of the numerous raider locations in the game to serve as a location to find this member of the LNL gang. This can potentially cause lore problems. 
For example, the wreck of the FMS Northern Star, which I did a video on, you can watch that here, is filled with a bunch of Norwegian ghoul raiders. They only speak Norwegian, they're all ghouls, they've been on that ship for over 200 years, but the in-game file mechanics classifies them as raiders. Therefore, it's possible for one of these LML gang members to appear at the FMS Northern Star, which would make no sense. None for a contemporary non-ghoul raider boss to be working out of a wrecked ship occupied by a bunch of 200-year-old ghoul Norwegian. Norwegian raiders. But the sheer magnitude of raider locations in the game means that this LNL gang experience is going to be very different for each player. The first one we are sent to assassinate is Lucky Tatum, and in my game, I was sent to the Revere Beach Metro Station. You saw earlier that I discovered this for the very first time. After I wound my way through the Metro Station, I found Lucky Tatum, as well as the original raider boss, Cinder occupying the same location. Cinder was the original raider boss for this location, and Lucky Tatum normally doesn't appear here. Since I had never been here before, I had to kill two raider bosses. But if you had already killed Cinder, you would only have to face Lucky Tatum. Their bodies have nothing interesting of note. Typical loot on Lucky Tatum's body, and the same for Cinder. And there's nothing around here that talks about the LNL gang. Set dressing doesn't change, there are no new props. All that happens with this quest is we get a new NPC raider to kill. So the game does not take any further steps to help explain who the LNL gang are. No notes, no terminals, nothing. Back at Railroad Headquarters, we can tell Desdemona that we were successful. Lucky Tatum is eliminated. Good. If we get a lead on any more of the LNL gang, I'll let you know. To trigger the next assassination, simply exit the Railroad Headquarters and return. Desdemona will be ready with another op. Right. We found another of the LNL gang. Her name's Big Maud. She's killed three synths that we know of. Revenge here will be sweet. Any more info on the target? We know where the raiders are. That's it. Make them pay. And that's all she says. Each time we get a new op, we can ask if Desdemona knows anything more, but she just says, we only know where the raiders are. Killing Big Maud brought me to Hyde Park. You saw on my map that I had not previously discovered this location, but in contrast to the last encounter, the original boss of this place was not here. I did an entire video on Hyde Park, so you can learn all about this place, including the lore and the previous raider boss, Scudder, by clicking here. But I sat from afar and sniped off each and every one of these raiders as they came within range, and not a single one of them was Scudder. So I'm not sure why the original raider boss was at the metro station, but not here at Hyde Park. Once they're all dead, we can head into Hyde Park and explore the bodies. I found the corpse of Big Maud. Again, nothing interesting on her body. And I know where Scudder is supposed to be, since I've already done a video on it, and I went to his location and he just was not there. So it looks like sometimes the game will place the LNL gang member alongside the original Raider boss, and sometimes the game will replace the original Raider boss with an LNL gang member. Heading back to Desdemona, we can tell her of our success. Maud's taken care of. Excellent. The LNL gang aren't rocket scientists, but even people like them probably know someone's on to them. As soon as I hear more, I'll let you know. Back in for round three. Boy. More news on the LNL gang. Stevie Buchanan is negotiating with another gang, trying to drum up allies. If we take him out before those negotiations are complete, it'll make our job easier down the line. You know what to do. Any more info on the target? No, but we believe the intel's credible. Get to it then. And again, no further intel. This time, we need to kill Stevie Buchanan. For this location, it randomly selected the Shamrock Tap House. But I forgot that by fast traveling to this tap house, we appear right in the middle of a whole bunch of raiders. So I spoiled my stealth this time. But once these external raiders were dead, I could sneak on inside. And we find Stevie Buchanan in the same room where we find Gaff. But I had already killed him on this character, so Gaff was not there. I also already did a video on the Shamrock Tap House, so if you're interested, you can find that video here. Hello. I'll find you.
Stevie's gone. That'll make other raiders think twice about helping the LNL gang. Good work. Pam estimates it'll take years to safely get all the synths out of the wealth. The wealth? Is it common to shorten Commonwealth as the wealth? Do people in Boston speak that way, or is this strictly a fallout thing? Maybe it's just a drummer boy thing. I've never heard anyone else refer to the Commonwealth as the wealth. <laughs> it seems strange to me. Anyway, back in for round four. The LNL gang hit some of our people. Tammy Mack caught a runner and his synth out in the open. Killed them very graphically to send a message. Unfortunately for her, she was sloppy, and we tracked her down. Now it's time to send a message of our own. Tammy Mack, Stevie Buchanan, Lucky Tatum. These sound like Triggerman names, mob names, mafia names. I kind of wish that we were killing Triggerman right now instead of Raiders, but I understand that that would have been more difficult from a game design perspective since there simply are not a lot of Triggerman locations in the game. That's partly why I kind of wish this was Triggerman. We get to fight so few Triggerman in the game. Really, there's Vault 114 and then a few quests in Good Neighbor and Easy City Downs, and really, that's about it. The quest to assassinate Assassinate Tammy Mac brought me to the federal ration stockpile. I realized that if I was trying to do a stealth playthrough, I probably should have come through the entrance in the old church. But I wasn't thinking about it right now, so instead, I stealthily killed everybody outside the federal ration stockpile and took the long way inside. We find Tammy Mac in the same room where we find Red Tourette. I've also done a video on Red Tourette. If you'd like to check that video out, you can get the full story of Red Tourette and her kidnapped sister by clicking here. It's an interesting raider story, so I encourage you to check it out. Back to Desdemona, we can tell her the good news. Tammy Mac's been dealt with. Hopefully, we can deal with the remaining LNL bosses before they find more of our people. Thank you. And then go back for round five. Only three LNL gang bosses left. It took some digging, but we found where the Bruiser is laying low. The Bruiser is our public enemy number one. End the synth killer. To the Mattress 5 sends us to the Kendall Hospital in search of the Bruiser. Now, as soon as I entered Kendall Hospital, while I was hacking a terminal of all things, I got a message saying that the Bruiser was dead. What? I was hacking a terminal. I didn't kill him. How did the Bruiser die? I mean, I could have gone back and turned in the quest now, but I wanted to find out exactly how this happened. After weaving my way through the hospital, I began to hear the roars of the Deathclaw, and then I remembered, that's right, at the very bottom of this hospital, there is a Deathclaw. But he is usually trapped behind a door. Did the Bruiser somehow unlock the door? This may be another unforeseen accident related to having these LNL gang boss members spawn at random raider locations. Maybe the Bruiser accidentally spawned inside the Deathclaw room or opened a door. Sure enough, we find the Deathclaw alive and well, wreaking havoc at the bottom so we can take him out. After he's dead, we do indeed find the body of the bruiser at the very bottom, in the hallway just outside the door where the Deathclaw was kept. Well, if you don't want to do a lot of fighting and you want to complete this quest, hope that the game sends you to the Kendall Hospital. Back at the railroad headquarters... The last of the LNL gang have banded together. They're hiding, but some very scared raiders ratted them out. Kill Captain Sally. Then finally, the LNL gang will be no more. On it. Just stay careful out there. To the Mattress 6 is the final quest in the LNL Gang Saga, and here we are to kill two raider bosses. We only have to kill Captain Sally to complete the quest, but there are two raider bosses at this location. This time I was sent to the Corvega assembly plant, and this time I did remember the back entrance to the dungeon, so I entered through the pipe instead of going through the front door. Inside the main car production facility, we find Captain Sally and Johnny T. Walters standing where Jared once stood. Someone's out there! Once they are dead, and their reign of destruction against the synths has been taken care of, we can head back to Desdemona to complete the quest. 
The last of the LNL gang have fallen. Over the years, LNL have killed so many, so much blood. I know it wasn't easy, but you've made the Commonwealth a safer place for everyone. Especially since. Take this. You've earned it. The reward for completing this quest is some pretty decent combat armor with some pretty good mods attached. But at this late stage in the game, it ended up being kind of worthless for my character. So now that all six, seven gang member leaders are taken care of, this leaves us with a final question. Who were the LNL gang? Why did they hate synths? How could they detect synths and track them down better than the Institute? Well, everything I'm going to say after this point is pure conjecture. There truly is no answer. The lore is not there. But there are a few clues laying about that I think we can piece together to come up with a satisfactory explanation. The first clue is when Desdemona talks about glory. Glory had been pushing me to deal with them for years. Looks like she finally gets her wish. At the very beginning, Desdemona tells us that Glory had a particular interest in the LNL gang. Why was Glory so focused on killing the LNL gang? Was it just because she was a heavy and that was just part of her job? Or did she have a past with the LNL gang? Maybe she knew them. Maybe they knew her. Maybe this was personal. There are only two pieces of evidence that I can find that uphold this theory. We find the first at the Poseidon Energy Factory, led by the raider leader, Cutty. I covered this place extensively in my video on Poseidon Energy in Fallout 4, which you can watch here. Inside the Poseidon Energy plant, we find the word glory scrawled on the wall next to Cutty's raider throne. Glory. Why is Glory's name on this wall? I asked that question over and over again in my Poseidon Energy video, and viewers had many great explanations. I even had one viewer hound me on Discord <laughs> with a rather intricate and insane theory uh, related to Saturn worship. I'm not going to get into it, but ultimately we really have no explanation as to why Glory's name is written on the wall in the Poseidon Energy building right next to a raider boss's throne. Why? Well, maybe Glory was a former raider. Maybe before she joined the railroad, she was part of a raider gang. This raider gang. The raider gang operating out of Poseidon Energy. But then Glory had a crisis of conscience, and she decided that being a raider was no longer for her. And so she developed a cause, something to inspire her, something to give her life meaning. And she thought, I know. I'll save the synths. And so she tracks down the railroad, joins the railroad, and becomes a champion for synth rights. But the raiders do not take her abandonment lightly. The raiders operating out of Poseidon Energy were part of a larger, loosely affiliated group of raiders called the LNL Gang. And to get revenge upon glory for her desertion, they decide to focus all of their efforts on killing synths. This will show her. This will punish Glory for betraying the LNL gang. This will punish her for ditching us when we needed her most. Instead of hunting down settlers and wastelanders, we will focus our aggression towards synths, the very people Glory left us to save. A pretty decent, plausible explanation, right? There is, of course, one hiccup. Glory says that she's a synth. They call me Glory, the angel of death. The ass-kicking poster child of a liberated synth. So you're a synth? That's what the maid in the Institute stamp on my ass says. I have a lot of questions about synths, about the Institute. Would you be willing to answer a few? If I have to. I know a whole lot less than you think. Mainly, I did surface detail. Combing over ruins and shit for salvage. The few times I was in the Institute proper, all I was to them was their thinking, feeling, hammer. What's the Institute like? Clean. Lots of metal and machines. But I really only saw a few rooms of it. The barracks and where I worked. I helped those assholes make more synths. Synth development is what they called it. How do they make synths? Damn if I know. The machines are massive, complicated. Not like anything I've seen out here. No matter what Des and others say, synths ain't human. We're assembled bone by bone, muscle by muscle. 
I've seen it. I'm gonna hit the range. I need to shoot something. Now. Glory says that she's a synth. How could Glory, a synth, be part of a raider gang? There are a couple of issues here. We do know of synths that have become raider bosses. Gabriel, for example. Gabriel was a synth who left the Institute with the help of the railroad. The railroad then wiped Gabriel's mind, and mind-wiped Gabriel chose to join the raiders at Libertalia and become their leader. Like any other human being, Gabriel had to decide what he wanted to become, what he wanted to do with his life. With his memories gone, with no memory of being enslaved in the Institute, no moral barometer to guide his decisions, he was a completely blank slate with an invented backstory by Dr. Amari. He chose in this new reality of his to become a raider. That was outside the railroad's control. They didn't know he was going to choose to become a raider. They didn't program him to become a raider, he just chose to become a raider. But at any rate, synths can make poor life choices, like becoming raiders after they leave the Institute. So if Gabriel was a raider, why couldn't Glory, also a synth, be a raider as well? Well, there's a big difference here. Gabriel didn't know that he was a synth. Gabriel thought he was human. His mind was wiped. But Glory knows that she's a synth. Glory, after she was released from the Institute, chose to keep all of her previous memories about the Institute and to join the railroad to help more of her kind. So it seems odd and unlikely that a freshly freed synth would first turn down the mind wipe that the railroad offered her, bid them farewell, gallivant off to find some raider gang, live as a raider for a couple of years, half a decade or something, murdering people, stealing their possessions, raiding caravans, taking cams, until one day she has a crisis of conscience and decides to join up with the railroad to free synths. Knowing Glory and knowing her character, I think that's unlikely. I think it's unlikely she would leave the Institute, believing it to be inhumane, believing that the Institute is enslaving her kind, only to digress ethically after she leaves and join raiders. Enslaving synths is bad, but murdering settlers, that's okay. Only to later jump back to believing that raiders are no better than the Institute. It makes more sense to me that she would have started as a raider, maybe out of necessity, maybe because she didn't know anything else, and only slowly realizing how unethical and evil it was over time. Where does this leave us? Well, what if Gloria's lying? What if she's not a synth? We already know that people on the railroad tend to lie. Deacon is a liar. He lies about everything. It's a big inside joke at the railroad. Oh, don't believe a word Deacon says. He's a liar. But what if he's not the only liar? What if the railroad agents have a habit of inventing false histories for themselves, alternate profiles for themselves that they present here and there to throw people off? And what if glories is that she is a synth? She's an escaped synth. But the reality is much different. What if the reality is that she is very, very human? She is so human that she has a dark past. A dark past working as a raider with the LNL gang. A dark past that she is sorry about, and a dark past which she has tried to put behind her by joining the railroad and finding a cause. But a dark past that Cutty at Poseidon Energy and the raiders of the LNL gang refuse to forget. A dark past that drives those raiders to target synths. And a dark past that Glory feels guilty about, which is why she, when she was alive, was so concerned with tracking down and eliminating the LNL gang. And when Glory dies on that horrible day, when the Brotherhood invades the railroad headquarters and she dies in combat, surrounded by Brotherhood of Steel night corpses, what do we find on her body? We do not find a synth component. Many people have said that this is an accident, this is a bug. Bethesda, don't you know your own lore? Which is why the unofficial Fallout 4 patch fixes it. If you have the unofficial Fallout 4 patch installed, there is a synth component on her body. But what if it's not a mistake? What if this is intentional? What if Glory was not a synth? What if Glory was human? As I said earlier, this is just conjecture. We don't really know. But... We do know that the LNL gang specifically targets synths. We do know that Glory was overly concerned with ending the LNL gang, that the LNL gang can appear at Poseidon Energy as one of the locations you go to eliminate them, that Glory's name appears on a wall in Poseidon Energy, 
and that Glory does not have a synth component. That's all the evidence we have. And I've given you my best guess. But what's yours? I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Do you think I'm onto something? Or do you think I'm full of hot air? Let me know in the comments section below. I read all of your comments, especially when they're on a topic like this that I am really curious about, and I use your comments as inspiration for my future videos. I publish six videos a week on a wide range of Fallout lore topics, spanning many games in the Fallout franchise, so if you want to make sure that you don't miss my next video, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. I've got a t-shirt shop, folks. If you would like an Oxhorn or a Fallout-inspired t-shirt, you can find a link to my shop in the description below. And if you like what I do and you want to support me in a more personal way, consider becoming one of my patrons on Patreon. Patreon subscribers get access to a private channel on my Discord server, as well as a bunch of other cool Oxhorn perks. But more than anything, ladies and gentlemen, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching watching, and I'll see you tomorrow morning, bright and early, with a brand new video. What do we do?